You want something uh, about my past, don't you? Uh, very uh, much, yes. Because um, I was a completely ordinary doctor uh, getting through my medical career um, <coughs> with no interest whatsoever in anything psychic or mysterious until a time when I it reviewed a book as editor of the Bath Journal, two books by Kenneth Walker, who was on the staff then. And it pleased him so much that he made us, our families, and his one, and asked us down on weekends. And at one point, he asked me to a meeting by a man called Uspensky. His full name was Pyotr Demianovich Uspensky. We refer to him as O. So I went along, not expecting anything. And from the first, seeing this stocky figure coming in unassumingly and not putting on any kind of act at all, I hung my coat in his door. He was the best man I could trust. And when you, after you had met Uspensky, what effect did that have on your life? Uh, it really changed it because my career was very promising when I met him. I was on the way to the staff of a teaching hospital and a specialist hospital at Brompton. But uh, when I told him that I'd be seeing a little less of him, uh, he said, oh, well, I might see you once a year. And so I gave up my career uh, promptly. Yes. <laughs> and uh, attended weekly meetings with him. What sort of man was he? He was a man who was determined to get the truth at any cost. He didn't mind. He was very cultured, uh, a literary man in Moscow, well-known uh, uh, editor of a paper. He uh, suited me because my only claim to fame was that, like the elephant's child in Roger Kipling's Just So Stories, I had an insatiable curiosity. Yeah. I wanted to know the truth, and so did Lispensky. And so he used to uh, ask me down, and I used to sit up with him all night, and we'd discuss magical evenings, but he always wanted to be informed on the latest uh, facts produced by science on man and on the universe. So we had many talks about that. He was also a very religious man, and he liked getting at the inner meaning of religious writings like the Gospels, and many conversations about, which you can bear witness to, about uh, the meaning, the psychological meaning of parables like uh, the prodigal son or the uh, good Samaritan, things like that. Was there any particular part of his teaching which attracted you very strongly? I think the psychological part, the, the fact that a uh, man doesn't know himself, that so everything begins with self-study. Until you know yourself, you can't really know how a human being works, how it's meant to work any more than until you drive a car, you can't know how a car is meant to work. And um, it's simply a question of what is meant by the strange uh, consciousness, strange word consciousness. When you went down there and um, took part in the weekends, what did you actually do? Uh, there was a farm, 30 or more acres, uh, and garden. My wife took charge of the ladies in the garden, and uh, about 40 people at the height came down at yes, weekends. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the men worked on the farm in the fields and uh, so on. We put in a pretty hard two days of work, and then in the evenings we sat up with him, a few of us. Were you very close to him? I think he 
was very glad to talk with me because I was a doctor. I first uh, of all met them uh, at Gadsden in Kent uh, and then was instrumental in the purchase of Lyon Place in Surrey where we lived through the war. My wife and family were great friends of Madame Spensky's family, so it was natural that we lived together yes. in that house. And was your wife as interested in Spensky's teachings as you were? She started by being furious with me for going out uh, in the evening when she was pregnant with her second child, feeling terribly sick. But having got her through that, uh, she was as keen as I was. She liked him, and Mr. Spensky admired her warm heart, a heart of gold, he said. And, but she was Madame Zinsky's little pet. And so uh, in her eyes, she could do no wrong, whereas in Madame Zinsky's eyes, I could no, do no right. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's said that they were very strict in their house. Is that true or not? Madame had a very strict formula, which she thought was the formula that Gurdjieff demanded. Actually, Uspensky was more, was closer to Gurdjieff in spirit than Madame. But it was very much uh, a semi-religious uh, institutional atmosphere. Yes. And when we took Aldous Huxley and his party down there, uh, this offended them very much. He was shown into the big dining room at Lion Place. Everybody was sitting like this. And he said, how dreadful, and never turned up again. <laughs> yes. And was Lyne and um, the house in London, were they um, brought at the same then, time? Then, just before Munich, uh, Ms. Pretensi got hold uh, from the Russian ballet of the house at Collet Gardens, as it was then, and we redecorated it from start to finish, and he held some very interesting meetings there uh, up to the mid middle of 1940, yes. when the bombing started. Uh, he used to attend them himself, uh, and they were carried on in both the, in the different studios at the same time. And then the admirals come and did it during the war uh, for the Navy, uh, naval exercises, uh, and we got it back with uh, considerable friction after the war, and they redecorated it again, ready for him to come for his last few meetings. Um, <clears throat> when he was already a very ill man. But I wanted to stress that for the last three years of his life, Spensky scarcely said a word. He was training those with him to understand what he wanted without his saying anything out loud. One had to infer what he needed. For instance, uh, he said, take meeting in New York. What should I talk about? Uh, talk about activities of men, in particular relation to crime. And one had to in, try and remember what he'd said in the past and uh, hold the meeting for him and then get torn to pieces on return. His ideas are now coming into the picture very much. Recent scientific ideas that the universe couldn't have started by chance and been maintained by chance were very much what he taught. And he also taught the psychology that man never remembers himself, himself. And the only things in his life that he remembers vividly are moments when he remembered himself. So all his teaching was directed to how to remember. And it was my particular province to try and find a man with a method, which turned out to be what we call now meditation, and he showed me enough of it so that when I met 
15 years later, the, the Maharishi, uh, whom you also know in London, <coughs> I was able to recognize the method as the one indicated. At the time that Uspensky died, what do you think was his greatest contribution with all your experience? I think I would say uh, that as well as the three dimensions of, of space, uh, there were three dimensions of time. And there was not only time as a straight line from before to after, beginning nowhere and ending nowhere, he called that the first dimension. The second dimension was time as a circle, where the beginning and the end meet, and everything um, could be described as part of some cycle. The cycles of partly in the uh, seasonal cycles, but also in <coughs> Uh, repetition or recurrence in eternity, that is, not on the line of before, now, after, but on a vertical line of now. When you came to take over Collet House, were you very daunted with the thought that you now had it to direct this It all happened so gradually. When he came back to England from America, having been there during World War II, he called me and another man and said, get me 300 people. And I said, well, uh, right. well how long have we got? He said, three weeks, about. And uh, what do we say to them? And he said, uh, why say anything? Just ask them what they want. Uh, well, we got the 300 people. Yes. <laughs> and he held those first meetings. And we carried on with what remained of that 300 yes. after his death in 1947. Looking back over your life and judging it from a personal level, what do you feel are the most important things that you've learnt and that you'd like to hand on? This fact that within one is already developed and already uh, in existence a hotline with the absolute a spark of the divinity which is the universe, the intelligence behind the universe. Intelligence is just a part of consciousness, but each of us have an atom of the consciousness, one element of the consciousness, which is, permeates the whole universe. Do you have any personal tricks or um, personal things which you can do to uh, or that you practice that, you, that can bring the memory of the divine spark back to you during the day? Have you any...? Just silence. There are moments during the day provided by nature when this is possible, but nobody knows about them and they pass them by. And every time we finish one set of motivations, one job, set of jobs, and. Uh, in the pause between that and undertaking the next. There is a, a pause when the mind is open, is free. If we pay more attention to those pauses and lengthen, so the present moment can be prolonged. This was another of Mr. Fensky's teachings. Any tips on how you do it? You just have to begin and go on and persist. It can't be described by anybody else. And I would like just to end up by telling a, st a story which is so, shows that everything is so simple, really, compared with the complexity that we make of it. Uh, three men spent a lifetime trying to climb laboriously a wall. And when at last they succeeded, the, the first man laughed so much uh, that he never came back. He jumped down and disappeared for keeps. The second man laughed inordinately. He laughed so that he fell down on the wrong side of the wall and uh, suffered multiple injuries. 
But the third man laughed in a good-natured kind of way and came back to help his friends. But there is no war. That's what everyone was laughing at. There's no war at all.